So we have joining us online Julie Avono. Hi, Julie. Julie Avono is the executive Hello. director of Internet Sands Frontiers, an affiliate of the Berkman Klein Center at Harvard University, and an inaugural member of the Meta Oversight Board. She founded the Content Policy and Society Lab at Stanford University, which prototyped a novel approach to multi-stakeholder collaborations to tackle content policy challenges. Through her work, Julie explores democratic paths to better governance of online content on traditional social platforms and emerging ones. Welcome, Julie. We also have Dan Mount. Dan is responsible for leading the development of Ofcom's regulatory approach for tackling online fraud and scams linked to their forthcoming duties under the UK Online Safety Bill. He has previously worked on internet, technology, and digital inclusion policy issues in the parliament, the third sector, a digital industry trade association, and private sector consultancy. It's a pleasure to have you with us today. And please also join me in welcoming Kate Klonick, who is an associate professor at St. John's University Law School, a fellow at the Brookings Institution, and at the Yale Law School's Information Society Project. Her writing on online speech, freedom of expression, and private internet Platform governance has appeared in both law reviews and international news publications. This academic year, she is a visiting scholar at the Rebooting Social Media Institute at Harvard's Berkman Klein Center. Welcome, Kate, and thank you so much for joining us from the US. And this is her second panel for the day. <laughs> uh, so about the panel today, we are at a stage where it's imminent that online harms are occurring because of platforms there is potentially a regulatory gap. And it's not just foreseeable, uh, but also ever increasing every day. All of us are profoundly vulnerable on the internet, but all of us are not equally vulnerable. Uh, on this panel, we will think through questions of shared responsibilities between private and public governance frameworks, as well as users, and standards of care that should be put in place to not just create a less harmful, but also a more caring internet. So jumping right in, my first question is, what even constitutes harm in the first place? What are the challenges of defining harms in cross-cultural environments? One example that I can think of in the context of dignity is gendered hate speech in countries like India and Brazil. And there has been criticisms that um, the mainstream global consensus on the boundaries of free speech doesn't adequately reflect all cultural contexts. So I guess the question is, why should Silicon Valley get to decide for the rest of the world when we have different cultural contexts, social consequences attaching to free speech, and also different constitutional rights and limitations? So how do we ensure that a very US-style First Amendment heavy, free speech friendly content moderation does not become the law of the internet all across the world at the cost of equality and dignity concerns? And particularly, how do we accommodate non-Western perspectives? Just a small question. <laughs> <laughs> Julie, do you want to start? Also, hi. <laughs> hi. <laughs> Now, um, at first, I wanted to, to to express my deepest regret not being able to uh, to travel uh, today to be with you all. But it's uh, thanks to technology. It's a great pleasure to be able to be part of this conversation. Um, should we let civil society come? Sorry, Silicon Valley companies decide what um, freedom of expression is for virtually everyone around the world. This question is precisely why I decided myself to come to the Silicon Valley, where I'm speaking from now. Uh, I've moved here two years ago um, as part of a, a, a fellowship that I had at Stanford University and also took the oppor opportunity to understand Silicon Valley, because until I came here, despite being a civil society leader, uh, for the, having been a civil society leader for the past 15 years, working on precisely issues related to freedom of expression, I had an absolutely very little idea or probably no idea how isolated, insulated many of the persons 
who make, uh, you know, the, the, the who used to make the decisions. I want to believe that. I'll get to that later in the discussion. But most of the persons, most of the companies, most of the departments are actually insulated from the rest of the world. And that is very problematic. Um, on the other hand, I also would like to, to, to kind of um, challenge a bit this assumption that, you know, uh, First Amendment is basically this idea that you can, your speech should be unfettered. Um, I had also this opinion, uh, having been trained in law in, in France with a very uh, uh, civilist uh, vision of, of law uh, and uh, with this idea that there should be interventions at some points, uh, government intervention, judiciary interventions to be even more precise, including when it comes to ex exercising our freedoms. And so I had this preconceived idea that, you know, such debates do not, such uh, interventions do not exist, uh, or at least conversations on these interventions do not exist in the United States. But we also see that, it, well, the past years, uh, at the very least since 2016, there is an, a sort of agreement that, yes, there are things that are not, that should be limited, uh, that should be, uh, prevented on online spaces if we want to preserve other rights, and that make that that takes me to my to probably one of the um, one of the ideas that I've been thinking a lot about recently when asked who should be deciding what framework should be deciding our freedom of expression, and I'm increasingly convinced, especially having worked uh, on the on the on the oversight board for the past two and a half years, I am increasingly convinced that. We do have an existing framework, um, as imperfect as it is, um, which is uh, around in, in international human rights uh, principles and standards that at some point in, in history, humanity, and I, I really think that it's a, the whole humanity, because when you read about the, the, the story of behind the drafting of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which has inspired so many conventions and so many covenants on human rights and, and, and its framework. Well, when you read that story, you read that it's a story of kind of a little bit like the sideboard, of course, uh, with you know limitations that apply, but experts who came from around the world uh, working on human rights, working on democracy, working on you know very, very se several issues, several rights that are now enshrined in those fundamental texts. And, and I th truly believe that this framework is the what the closest we can come to uh, to what humanity considers as important when you are a human being entitled with dignity and the consequent rights that we derive from this. So for me, that framework should inspire anyone who is genuinely interested in preserving human rights and and freedom of expression from harms. Now, when you ask what is harm. Uh, if that was one of your, what, what, the related question, I, I think maybe we should agree that harm is an a, 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 a dis imbalance, an imbalance in the balance that should exist between all the rights that human right, that humans should be able to enjoy. If there is an imbalance between your safety and your privacy versus your freedom of expression or someone else's freedom of expression, that creates a, a harm for me. And, and that's where interventions are necessary, um, but we'll get further into that. So uh, who's, no, it's not Silicon Valley who should decide on its own. Uh, governments still do have responsibility historically and politically to um, uh, set the, the frameworks, the democratic frameworks. But in the absence of that, or when that comes too late, when innovation evolves so rapidly, I do think that, yes, there is room for companies to uh, set some rules, but not alone. They need to do, uh, to do that with society, civil society organizations, of course, users, why not? And, and academia who have been thinking about those issues for a very long time and even imagining the potential scenarios even before they happened. So long answer, I apologize, but that's what I could say to the question. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. I think it's particularly helpful to frame it as a confluence of values and then so that we don't just micro focus on to this unfettered free speech idea and think about the other values in context. 
Kate, do you want to come in on Yeah, this? I just want to thank Julie for being the person correcting people about the First Amendment. Um, usually that's my job, is the, like, but I feel like she has, she brings actually much more gravitas to it because she's like, let me tell you, I used to be one of the people that thought that it just meant this, necessarily meant this absolute kind of notion. But um, the one thing that, um, that I will just quickly add, thought I don't think I think that Julie actually did like a remarkable job um, kind of fleshing out all kind of the parameters of this um, is that I will just mention that there are that we are solidifying around some best practices that are procedural and that are institutional and kind of and like as we are in this developing space of essentially the internet over the last 20 or 30 years developing and figuring out and stabilizing and what we want and what we need to do um, we've seen it in kind of a, like in the private lab like the lab they used in the states they call the states the laboratory of kind of like the things where you can have democratic experimentation before it goes to kind of a federal, a federal type of level. And I almost feel like there has been a time in Silicon Valley for a long time in which there was kind of that laboratory effect and then things have been coalescing. The comp like certain companies have gotten bigger. Um, there is like this kind of growth of, of um, of best practices that have also happened actually through the trading of the labor. Um, the same people who worked early on um, at Facebook doing certain types of governance and putting certain types of governance policy in in like the early 2000s, then went and did that work at Twitter, then went and did some of that work at places like Airbnb or other types of platforms as they kind of developed. And so there's actually been this kind of cross pollination. So I will say that like, then you're seeing people leave industry and also go into civil society or also go into or start their own like kind of organizations to advise um, these types of things. So I do think that we're, we're slowly developing and I, I think that essentially part of the balance um, that Julie is talking about and kind of flags about like kind of not just Silicon Valley, but then who, and also we can't have the we can't just ha give over this power entirely to nation states because all we can't even agree on you know who are, well, there's jurisdictional issues obviously is the development of this interstitial space um, with civil society international kind of international law international institutions one of which is uh, the oversight board which is the which Julia is on and it's been part of developing um, so I do you know but there it's a giant giant global ecosystem that is like so many complex parts and just the fact that that we're talking about international human rights and have been talking about international human rights as a way to frame these online harms is a much more sophisticated conversation than we were having even five years ago and I think that you know um, it comes from there being a necessary listening period finally from kind of the move fast and break things culture of Silicon Valley to bringing in experts that think about these things all the time and can start to peel back or like to start to try to show people how to mitigate the harms that the, the technology companies amplify and reproduce. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, yeah, well, I think uh, Julie and Kate made uh, a lot of the key points in, in that territory. I think I'd probably make just one small, slightly tangential point, which is, I guess, in terms of cross-cultural challenges, uh, looking at harm that uh, in, in many ways there's not necessarily, um, there's quite a lot of inconsistency across different, you know, global languages in terms of content moderation and that can be for various reasons, obviously more likely if it's a smaller market with a smaller number of, of people speaking that language that there's less incentive to invest there. But I think, I think I almost, I remember hearing someone say that, um, that the, uh, that because the European Commission invests on translating all of its official documents into all 24 different languages of the EU, that that's been an amazingly useful source of training data, which means that in terms of European <laughs> moderation, that's sort of a, hmm. a boost. I, I don't know to what extent that's true, given that I'm not, not sure how much sort of um, hate speech is, is included in those official documents. So you kind of still need to do the dedicated work to understand you know, what the different slurs are, what the different uh, terms of abuse and, and approaches are, but um, but I think that's a really important dimension for making sure that you do get more more consistency at a, a global level. Thank you, and that also makes me think about um, 
the issue about languages is that even though we're, there's this giant internet ecosystem, content moderation is not neutral across borders. And sometimes it's for linguistic reasons because content moderators in countries like Myanmar, uh, it was a big failure and it showed us how hate speech on Facebook can really get out of hand when content moderators don't understand local languages. Um, and also, personally for me, the contrast was very jarring when Trump's misinformation got taken down by Twitter almost immediately. But then I see Indian politicians spreading hate speech and fake news and still being platformed. So, um, I, yeah, I think I would like to hear from you, Julie, about how it has been creating policy contextually with localized tech communities and engaging stakeholders. And uh, like, what sort of value do you think that can add to content moderation as it is right now? No, um, you're, I mean, I, I very much agree. Uh, there is a, there are lots of imbalances, that is for sure. I think if there's one thing where we should all agree now is that when it comes to content moderation, there are priorities. Uh, there will probably be even more priorities as we are seeing technology companies laying off people um, in uh, the, the most spectacular way being, uh, you know, a whole bunch of the trust and safety team, the human rights team at Twitter being uh, quasi dismantled. So there, there are imbalances and there are choices, but uh, speaking as a civil society, uh activist leader who has tried to raise the awareness of the companies on you know their their responsibility and i would even say especially as we are in a time of conflict where we do see where we have seen unfold since february 2022 we have seen unfold all the reaction chain reactions of what happens when you let disinformation international disinformation remain unaddressed in different languages, what can happen on a geopolitical front? We've all heard about the, the, um, the wheat crisis earlier this year, where Russian state propaganda was using uh, the, the, the blockade, well, it's war, uh, using that to, to uh, convince African nations, uh, Latin American nations, Asian nations, who are traditionally, many of them, allies of Western Western democracies will convince them that this is all because of Western democracy that you don't not, that we, you will not have wheat later in the year. And they have done so convincingly. If you if you look at how how much if you look at the votes at the Human Rights Council, for instance, uh, when it was asked to to um, nations who are member of the United Nations, whether or not Russia should be suspended from the Human Rights Council, just look at who voted no. And you will know precisely where this information has not been addressed because it was in another language and because we thought it's okay it's you know it's just africa it's just latin america it's just asia excuse my my uh, you know my provo my provo provocation here but this is really what happened and this this is what the consequences of you know setting priorities with a short sight lead you to um and 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 that is the message that i i personally uh, but but beyond me, many others have tried to uh, explain to social media companies that no, it is not about the U.S. It is not all about Canada. It's not all about European Union. If you close your eyes on what is happening elsewhere beyond those borders, well, you lose the opportunity to actually address what can backlash and what will certainly, certainly, that is, you know, unquestionable now, uh, many examples have proved it in the recent history, you will miss out on addressing what will backlash in a few years from now or a few months. And uh, really the, the conflict in Ukraine has shown, has showed that, sorry, I'm mixing my tenses here, but um, uh, all this to say that, uh, yes, it's uh, setting priorities should not just be about, you know, money, uh, where do we want, where do we expect that we'll make most money? I think uh, part of the priorities should be set with in mind, where, we, where will we avoid 
the next catastrophe? Where in the world should we work now to address the next catastrophe that will backlash here to the United States or to Canada or to uh, European Union markets? Yeah. So I, um, this is a great question and everything Julia said just feeds so well into kind of what I was going to say, but one of the things that, to this point, one of the things that when I'm at least in a, when I'm at least in an American market, Americans are always shocked by this, um, is to tell, um, remind Americans that they're only seven to eight percent of users on Facebook, to which Americans are always like, because we think that we're the center of everything. <laughs> Julie's like, checks out. <laughs> um, but uh, the... Uh, there is this kind of this seven to eight percent, but the really fascinating part about that seven to eight percent is that the average rate per user for Facebook, for example, the amount of money that they make off of each user is around $68 in North America. And the next closest market for that is the EU, which is $14. So to let you know where they're putting the efforts into doing really careful content moderation and like and trying to make certain types of users happy and comfortable and feel like they want to spend time on the platform where their advertising is sales are the highest and the most valuable that is in unfortunately still in North America and um, they categorize and this is an industry term not my term the rest of world and other types of markets as like two, I think around two dollars. Um, that are not like MENA and, uh, and um, Asia, which around like, I don't know, four or six. Um, this is just like a massive, massive like set of facts that I think needs to be surfaced more because it shows why certain companies have motivations to go into certain countries to do proper motivation. It also reveals kind of this very, I think, thorny question in a place like Myanmar, which we all know had like, in which the tech companies obviously did not think through in the, um, in the long term, the effects that their platform would have, but also what that, like why it really, why they didn't, which was that it, would, it made no sense for their bottom line to spend money on 14 different kind of language translators for Myanmar. Um, to do the type of language uh, translation and the type of online harms mitigation that they would need to do, um, or the beta testing or anything else. Um, I don't think the solution to that is not bring, having companies bring internet to Myanmar. That's like a paternalistic, awful kind of notion. The solution to that is, like I said before, kind of everything that Julie is saying, which is to essentially instead like start to have best practices and start to mandate that these types of things, and this is actually, I think, I don't know how this would actually be coordinated, but I've been thinking a lot about this, about like a mandated cost spreading if you operate at a global scale um, between your largest, most revenue generating markets and emerging markets that you, um, that you, that like present other types of possibilities. Because I do think that having something like that is not going to necessarily bring a drive censorship. It's not necessarily going to kind of be getting into the substantive, um, regulation of speech. It's just about creating better procedures and safety mechanisms that are in place once you go into a market like that. I'm just uh, weighing up whether I want to try and be devil's advocate against my previous point, which would be tricky to do. But I think, no, I mean, I agree with that. But I, I think it's interesting because depending on what lens you look, th you look through, in a sense, if, if say, the, the, you know, TikTok or Instagram or Facebook um, is basically funded by advertising revenue in, in mature markets in you know, Western Europe and, and the US or primarily in the US, then in a sense, if they're offering the same functionalities worldwide, then that's almost a you know, cross subsidy of investment in the product, which then everybody gets to benefit if, if you look through one's lens. But I guess to return to, my, to Kate's points and mine about the language side, I guess it's almost saying if you're gonna do it properly, you need to, to make it do a proper cross subsidy to make sure that you're doing the same level of, of trust, trust and safety. Yes, um, you can't trust the companies moderation. to do the to do the trust and safety. I think. Yeah, I think that that's exactly right. Right. Can I can I can I briefly uh, you know I I I, I do I, what, what I do agree you know absolutely we should be trusting the companies but the reality is also that we are at. I would say a kind of historical crossroads again 
because even when it comes to connectivity itself and access to those platforms and services, um, if we if we go on and you know, kind of I don't want to I don't want to say accept, but uh, well, I'll use that word for lack of better expression. I apologize, but if we accept this idea that you know, spending a lot on a user that you know get pays you back two dollars. Is it, is it actually worth it? Well, in the end, you might actually lose access to all that market because at the very moment where we are yeah. thinking about philosophically about that, there are other governments who are advocating for another type of connectivity, for another type of responses to safety challenges posed by content. And that solution is close up yourself from American companies and from European companies and from you know Western companies. We have excellent solutions, uh, let's say Chinese solutions that can help you deal very well with that. Just cut cut off everything that you disagree with. And I, for me, it's not it's not a solution either. And I agree with that with, with, on, on that with Kate saying that some places around the world should not have access to the Internet just because excuse my expression, but just because, you know, the, the, the lots of challenges and we don't have enough to spend there, uh, it, it's, it just doesn't make sense because it goes beyond those mi micro you know, issues. It's really systemic. It's about what type of internet we want on the way forward. Do we still want it to be open, interoperable, blah, 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 all the things we've been talking about in the past 20 years? Or do we want to admit and say, okay, there are borders on the internet too, and then I'm gonna lose my job. So I, I hope that's not gonna be the case. <laughs> But uh, yes, that that's a dilemma, and I, we should be very conscious of that, including the tech companies whenever they decide to prioritize where they are going to invest content moderation. Mm. Mm. Thanks, Julie. And I think it's very useful that like our takeaways from what we just discussed is probably that we can all agree we don't want a splintered internet, and we also don't want an internet where companies are only looking at their bottom lines when they're making decisions. And that makes me wonder, like, how do we proactively try to safeguard the interests of the most vulnerable communities online? Because um, like we discussed, vulnerability is not equally shared. And also, when we're looking at lawmaking, how do we ensure that law catches up with technology? Because Recently, I was reading something about um, a woman, Kate Isaacs, who started the hashtag Not Your Porn campaign in the UK, and she was deep faked. Her face was deep faked and imposed onto a porn video. And this was arguably done to silence her and reduce her public participation. And she was quoted as saying that the UK online safety bill was drafted three years ago at a time when deep fakes were, uh, were not as common, like you couldn't just download an app and do it, you had to be professionally trained to do it. But now times have changed. So how do we as regulators or overseers ensure that regulation catches up to technology? Yes, well, I think we, with the uh, online safety bill, um, I, or I guess it's, it's like, a, almost a caterpillar which has turned into multiple different times, kinds of butterfly over time to an extent, um, if you forgive the expression, because obviously it was published in draft um, form, it was, went through parliamentary scrutiny, it was then introduced to parliament in a different form, it's then been amended as it goes through parliament, it will continue to be amended going through parliament, so in one sense I don't think we're, we're wedded to the draft from three years ago, which I think is, is, is good news. I think that um, in terms of adapting to new technologies, I think that is, that is a challenge because obviously um, if regulation is, is hyper-prescriptive and tells companies to do A, B, C and D in exactly this way, otherwise you're non-compliant and you'll be fined 10% of turnover, that means that stops innovation in, in terms of finding new ways to protect users and uh, responding to newly evolving threats, uh, which is particularly important in areas like deep fakes and also in areas like fraud and scams where it's very much an adversarial relationship where as soon as a platform has a mitigation approach which is successful then a lot of bad actors are consistently looking how to circumvent that. So 
I think that um, it is a genuine challenge. Um, I think one part of it is to make sure that, that um, and in a sense, the bill nods this way to some extent where it's got some high-level um, uh, uh, safety duties, which um, companies need to comply with, but then Ofcom, the UK communications regu regulator, my employer will be writing codes of practice which give uh, set out recommended steps for companies to follow in um, complying with those safety duties. But they can also take any other um, approach uh, they like if they can demonstrate that it also meets the safety duty level. So there is flex in that system. And I think ideally that, that sort of approach will enable a bit more flexibility and innovation rather than just a regulatory straitjacket. Um, I was just thinking about this the other day. I'm watching the DSA and the um, thinking about the DSA and the DMA and watching Twitter implode. And um, thinking about very large online platforms, this term of this term of art, which is kind of funny, um, uh, that coming out of the DSA DMA, that um, and you know, watching also Meta's uh, eleven thousand job layoff and kind of declining numbers and revenue and everything else, and thinking like, will there be any very large online platforms left when the DSA goes into implementation in eighteen months? Um, and so, uh, you know, there is a reason that in like a, there's arguments that a philosophical philosophical arguments that law and regulation are designed to move slowly, <laughs> specifically because if you overreact in these types of moments, or react um, react from a space of I guess like to use like the a, Daniel Kahneman kind of idea from a system one brain, from a brain of like kind of very instant uh, uh, emotion or uh, or ideology and not from a kind of a rational and cognitive kind of thinking something through approach that you end up with poor regulations can poorly designed. Um, I don't know. I think that those are, I think that those are threats. The thing that I worry about, frankly, well, like less with the UK harms, um, Bill, but the but with the DSA and DM, DMA is essentially what happened with the GDPR, which is that this large comprehensive regulation comes out. It's extraterritorially enforced, essentially, through the platforms because it's just easier. We all feel the effect. And there are um, essentially, uh, it blocks its existence, blocks like new types of innovation and regulation in from other countries that are more effective, possibly. And so like one of the things that you're already seeing is watching the DSA kind of come out of the box and people being like, oh, it's just like, or watching the California Consumer Protection Act basically mimic the GDPR um, and not, you know, people not going back to the drawing board and actually trying to kind of improve on some of these systems, I think is one of the, one of the main downsides to rushing into huge omnibus kind of comprehensive regulation on these, on these types of issues. Um, I'm curious what Julie thinks. No, no, I, I agree with, with you both. Uh, and thank you so much, Anna for, you know, this question, because I guess everyone is, is wondering uh, what about what about the law? Um, and 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 I agree with what you've just said, Dan. It's um, it, it will always be a race uh, uh, against. I don't know. Um, it, it's going to be, in my opinion, uh, there there is lots of energy that is being lost in trying to uh, tell the companies exactly in nitty gritty details how they should address content. But there is less energy, and I found that extremely unfortunate in addressing the overarching frameworks and systems. I really like this this you know notion of system that you've been using, Kate, because this is really what it's about here. And the Twitter meltdown for me is exactly the proof of that. Uh, we don't we don't have a system in place to prevent that a someone who has who happens to have a lot of money for the person, but someone who happens to have a lot of money can come in the midst of a very major election in, in you know, in the United States and dismantle, uh, you know, not as dismantle, but almost dismantle um, trust and safety teams, human rights team, and many other integrity teams that are so essential uh, in responding to, to threats, especially in times of elections. Are, is, is that normal? 
I, I don't think it is. I, I don't think I I hope there will be at some point some safeguards that can um protect us from that. And those safeguards, I would believe, should have come from from states, but we do not have that answer yet. What instead, what type of answers we have instead is, oh, in the United States, we are Republicans and we think that we are being harassed by liberal social media platforms. So we should adopt laws that prevent them from suppressing speech based on your viewpoint, for instance. Or if you're in the European Union and you're, you know, um, although I, I have huge, huge, huge respect for the, the huge effort behind the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act, indeed, my question is, to, to what extent is it going to be even relevant? Uh, because, you know, we are on the apparently uh, at the dawn of the development of, you know, decentralized social media platforms. How do you apply DSA, DMA in that framework? Or uh, we are in the midst of probably having more immersive social media platforms. Uh, how, how do you take down or leave up do they mean anything in those spaces at all? Uh, take down or leave up of content? How can we uh, make sure that the, the the interactions that will happen on those spaces are are you know saved for um, investigative purposes? Do, do we do we have any questions about that about those safeguards? So for me, it's um, again we would waste way I mean much more energy, but in a better sense reflecting on those overarching principles and values that should guide any innovation that entails human interactions and, and, and content production, uh, instead of focus of trying to be CEO in the place of the CEO or being trust and safety in the place of the trust and safety, we will never be able to do that. Trust and safety is a science. It's not something that you do, you come and you do it. No, it takes years of, of, of you know, of trying, of failing, and of seeing what works, and of interacting also with communities, uh, including around the world. So it's not just something that you can craft in, in a law just like that. Um, so yes, to 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 finish, uh, governments really do have an opportunity here to play their role, which is especially democratic governance. Uh, governments to yes remind us the principles and the values that should exist no matter the infrastructure, no matter the innovation, no matter the CEO who is coming and taking over everything and asking everyone to sink it in. <laughs> Thanks, Judy. And yeah, I believe that um, it's a good reminder to not be overzealous as well, uh, to understand the risks of overregulating a space too. But at the same time, the jeopardy of leaving everything to the marketplace because then a Twitter can just be bought out. Uh, so this, like we also talked about going back to the drawing board in terms of drafting laws and that makes me think about intermediary liability as well. Um, so how do we balance this growing call for greater due diligence by platforms against first principle values like user privacy? because the reason that platforms have been given safe harbors is because they claim to not editorialize content and to not be aware of what is being published on there. So, and how do you do that without chilling free speech and uh, having a lot of takedowns to evade liability? Like any of you can answer this. Um, well, on the, the challenge of uh, sort of warning to platforms to to do more to, to mitigate harm, but at the same time, the impacts on, on privacy. I mean, that's obviously a, well, I mean, online safety in general, I think is a sort of three-way set of trade-offs between you know, user protection on, uh, on one side, and freedom of expression and privacy on the other, and then sort of an innovative and competitive uh, you know, market for online services. And the point is you can't really have, you know, if you have the, the freest, most innovative, uh, you know, ecosystem of, of services, you will probably not have the safest ecosystem. And if you have the safest one, it's probably not going to be uh, quite as, as private and quite as free, um, uh, you know, and, and, and innovative, etc. But with the privacy point, I mean, with the, the way the online safety bill is approaching that is that um, in terms of controlling the mitigating the, against the risk of overregulation is that um, there, there's um, for, for 
Ofcom, the regulator, to require the use of, of what is called proactive technology, which I guess just means tracking user behavior, um, user profiling, uh, and you know, collecting data on content moderation, et cetera, that, that can only, we can only require that in quite specific circumstances rather than just blanket, just it, continuously saying, do more of this, do more of that, run classifiers across your whole platform looking for anything. Um, we'd have to, you know, on the one hand, weigh up the severity of harm, the effectiveness of the proposed intervention, or, and, and balance that against the impact on freedom of expression and the uh, impact on privacy. And if there is an instance where we can identify another intervention which is less privacy intrusive, then we should go that way rather than the other. So I think, I'm not saying that's a silver bullet, but it's a way of, of you know, a, a break on sort of regulatory intervention or regulatory requirements, um, you know, being uh, inherently sort of privacy trampling. Julie, do you want to add something? Go ahead, Julie. Yes, no, um, I, I, I very much agree with what with, with my colleagues have, have rightly said. Uh, and probably just to um, add a little bit to, to that, it's a, it's a very difficult balance just to be stricken, uh, you know, not chilling uh, innovation expression, but at the same time ensuring uh, safe spaces. But I, I almost want to provocatively say we, we, we do that in our very physical worlds. Uh, we think a lot about, you know, the, the trade-offs. Um, and I, I believe that we can do as well for online spaces, provided that we accept that it's not through a, you know, a, a dialogue behind closed doors between governments and companies only that we will get there. And unfortunately, on many of the, you know, the, the, the conversations on te tech regulation and particularly content regulation, uh, one of the biggest frustration that I felt as a civil society activist is seeing those 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 doors close <laughs> when I'm just about to to come to get in. So um, um, it will require a, a very good tech regulation and content regulation requires obviously a multi-stakeholder approach that for me is you know the very basic element today. There is no good regulation that can come out when it's only two parts of the network, uh, namely private companies and governments, private sector companies and governments saying that this is what should be done. No, you have a lot of users uh, especially vulnerable users, those on the margins. Uh, I have a, a colleague at the, the, the Berkman Klein who worked on designing by the margins, listening to those minorities who, you know, usually do not make the headlines, uh, but who are all actually very creative in imagining solutions and actually seeing the harms first, what could go wrong first. Listening to those margins will tell you a lot about the future. My colleague is Afsan Ebrigo. She's, um, uh, you know, she works at Article 19 and has developed this, this theory of developing through the, by the margins. And I, I find this fascinating because it is true. If you, if you take the example again of, of Twitter, uh, a study was published in 20, I think in 2018 by Amnesty International that proved that if you're a woman and a minority woman, a black woman more specifically, you are more likely, I don't have the stats in mind, but I think it was more than 70%, you have more chances of being victim of harassment if you're vocal on top of that, of being victim of harassment uh, and, and insult and doxing and all those very horrible harms that happen to women online. Well, if we, if we decide one day to design by the margins and if we listen to what users who are experiencing today the future that we will experience, that the majority of us will experience tomorrow. If we do that, then we have regulation that can um, address the problems better, including the future ones, without unnecessarily stifling on free speech or stifling on innovation. But until we get there, there's going to be a lot. But I'm hopeful that what we're seeing now unfolding will certainly, you know, force us to rethink the way we're doing tech regulation at the moment. So I'll just briefly take the intermediary liability question. Um, so there's a bunch of 
concepts and tort theory of like what specifically you're supposed to accomplish with intermediary, li li intermediary liability. So if you defame me um, or Julie defames me on, on Twitter or something, I can still sue Julie, right? Intermediary liability just means that I can sue Twitter too. Um, but the, you have to kind of, to whether or not you're going to reframe intermediary liability rules, you have to kind of, as we do with, as we've talked this whole panel about doing is like be really thoughtful about what the fallout of just taking the, like t taking this, take the, oh, well, like why not like let people sue Twitter? Um, for one, one of the good things is that you would send a strong signal to Twitter that it's important that there are voices that like they take defamation and other types of harm seriously, um, that that's something that they should do for people generally. They have deep pockets, so like I would be able, if Julie defames me, like I would be able to get more money than I could, no offense Julie, but um, <laughs> I would be able to get more money from Twitter than, uh, not I don't know anymore, but at least for a while ago, I could get more money from, from Twitter than I could get from Julie. Um, and you know, and it creates kind of these, these risk assessment, these best practices of, of kind of forcing accountability, especially when you have class action kind of suits around tort and allowing kind of better design practices to become normalized and things like that. You have to ask though that in a speech environment, whether or not that is act, like that, whether or not that has the same effect um, when you're operating at scale. So like, if you are operating at scale and you're not like the New York Times, for example, um, you it is harder for you to do fine grain content moderation, or for harder for you to do um, to 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 accurately assess and do the like the factual inquiry into whether I actually Julie actually defamed me, and it's not just her opinion, for example. And so, if you're going to do something, if you're going to have that type of thing, what is the risk assessment going to be to the platform? The platform is simply going to say, well. If we potentially are going to be held liable for this kind of speech, um, and we're going to have to pay out all this money to Kate, then we're just going to side with Kate, and we're going to take down Julie's speech. Now, I mean, just like that's at the very outset, you can see how that leads to a sensorial environment and this collateral censorship by the platform, and that is specifically what intermediary immunity. Um, from liability, like Section 230, was designed to, to stop. Um, the problem with that is that the things I mentioned before that are good about intermediary liability, creating good design practices, surfacing them, allowing people to address harms, those didn't exist. And so it took us a long time. There was no pressure on the companies to take action to get to good design mechanisms until kind of they were in this kind of reputational free fall um, for a lot of these things. And an entire election in the United States, for example, was like, you know, was was um, was impacted, um, and so like, so that's kind of I think the trade-off between intermediary liability, and I guess I would say I don't know where it gets us now, if that is like the best, if like I don't know what we get from fixing that. Current, like going back to that type of system, I think that you do end up potentially with a lot of strategic legal action against um, against private parties in order to censor certain people's type of ideas. I mean, now you put that on steroids. Imagine like Russia flagging all of every dissident's tweets, uh, every or everyone else, you know, and, and they'll just take them down. So that's all it takes, like to s s silence an entire movement. Those are really important human rights concerns, also. So, anyways, that's kind of where I fall in the intermediary liability thing. I generally, I'm not like a pro Section 230 person. I just think that at this point, it, cert it did what it needed to do at a time. Maybe we evolved too slowly. Maybe we could have gotten there faster if there had been some level of tort liability, but I certainly don't know that it adds that much to the conversation now. Okay. Thank you. Can I, can I briefly, sorry, can I, can I briefly ask a follow-up to Kate, if that's okay? Yeah. Um, on that intermediary liability questions, I, I wanted to know your opinion on uh, the fact that advertisers right now are basically, you know, uh, the fact that advertisers, especially we've seen that on Twitter, do not want their ads associated with certain content. Does that in any way contribute to forcing companies take down or at least 
dealing much better with speech. Do you think that we can have better content moderation with ad advertisers? Um, that's Thanks. Oh, I actually think this is a, this is a, that's a fascinating question um, and a really good one. I mean, that's just not, I mean, it is a form of intermediary liability, but it is not a regulated one, right? It's not under the law. It's just a normative one um, or a market-driven one. Um, and I think that there's actually a really great paper that was just done out of Wharton. Um, oh my God, I can't remember. I'll um, send it and maybe it can go up later, but... Anyways, they ran a bunch of different models, Julie, that was like, one was a subscription based, whether or not people were satisfied and the content moderation was optimal across a couple of different metrics was pretty well done. Um, and deep sample sizes that were essentially like whether content moderation was better in a subscription model or ad revenue model. Um, and essentially it came out that the content moderation was much more sensitive and, and better braided by the people who were using the platforms in an advertising revenue model. And I have, there's, I have some theories for that. One of the theories that I have for that is essentially that a subscription model has stickiness. Uh, so people just don't leave and people don't feel, and the people running the platform don't feel like they have to be as responsive to the subscribers because they're there already and have paid. The second is that a subscription kind of platform is usually essentially smaller and also like more community and interest based. And so like you are subscribing to that and you're already, there's just probably fewer conflicting uses like on the platform because it's like, you know, if we're all subscribing to Town and Country Magazine, we're not gonna, you know, and then they, you know, run an article we don't like, it's probably not gonna happen, I guess is what I'm saying, is you, if it's less likely to kind of happen in those types of small kind of communities. And so advertising, to run a large advertising revenue driven platform, you have to actually take in more conflicting uses and do a better job moderating that content while also serving advertisers. Um, so anyways, but that's, that is, I think that that's, um, I think that's a pretty interesting study that just came out, so. Thank you. And I'm mindful of time now. So without much ado, we have like a rich exchange of ideas going on, but I would open the floor to questions from the audience. Wait. My name is Yiming Wei, and I have a math and data science background. So from tech, uh, technically, I think perhaps um, the guy who decide our freedom of speech might not be the CEO of Google or Facebook, but the models or the algorithms there. So sometimes, you know, you have a lot, billions of kind of Twitter, uh, words or kind of you know, expressions in Twitter or something like that. So it's impossible for uh, to hire some guys you know, to check whether these kind of expressions should exist or just be filtered. So, so how do we deal with these kind of issues? I mean, you have the models here and we could say that, okay, so the guys who develop these models should take the responsibility of everything. But they just said, okay, so I will show you all the codes here thousands of lines, and then we could not understand what's happening there, especially when we are using machine learning techniques. So how do we deal with these kind of uh, situations in terms of the regulations here? Thank you. What is Ofcom doing? Ah, well, it's, a, it's a great question to have the opportunity to answer, definitely. Um, so I think in terms of algorithmic you know, capacity, I, I, I don't think I've got a silver bullet on that, but obviously when you've got like layered deep learning models or whatever it is to you know driving a, a machine learning classifier you're right that if you just you know th there's a lot of um commentary sometimes saying open up the algorithms that's what we want you open it up you don't actually learn anything i guess there is more the question about the sort of you know the training data that you use the, the sort of intentionality the principles the purpose for which the algorithm is constructed and in a sense potentially some kind of independent sort of input output testing on what happens. So take an algorithm, put something in, what comes out, repeat, and then that can give you a guide as to what it practically is doing. But I think that's still an area where we have you know, plenty of more work and exploration to do. Can I briefly jump in please on that uh, very timely question? Um, that's one of the reasons why I, I, I launched the Content Policy Insights Lab at Stanford University, because I faced that exact problem, but from the other side. Uh, to, to tell you uh, the background, so we had this project about 
monitoring hate speech and um, letting the platforms know about the hate speech that we're seeing and the groups and the, the dissemination of such speech. Uh, well, this was our assessment that this was hate speech based on the company's community guidelines. And the huge frustration that we faced was that all the reports, many of them, uh, were not being addressed. We were still seeing the same type of you know, content on exa in exactly the same groups spread by exactly the same individuals. And so um, when I when I came to, um, when I st started my, my fellowship uh, at Stanford, the first thing that was asked to me is, have you reached out to product teams and to data scientists within the, the companies? And I thought, no, I didn't. We were interacting mostly with policy individuals. And, and that's why I realized there is a, a disconnection. And, and really, I feel like people working on algorithms are insulated from the, the rest of the world, the real world, excuse my expression. I will say that even more uh, since I, I, I've been working on the other side board and we've been, I've learned so, so much interacting with teams that work on other things that, that, that relate to content, but are not, you know, the, the policy side of things, but really the technical aspect and sides of these things. And I, and I, what I would like to share is that there is benefit in making sure that those individuals, those engineers working within companies on very complex issues related to algorithms, there would be huge benefit of them speaking more to the society, interacting more with the society. Uh, and when I mean society, not only your immediate society, but also users on the other on the other side of the earth. Uh, there's benefit because you can have a firsthand account, uh, not only reading in the newspaper whenever there is a scandal, but I think there would be a benefit doing that in having uh, regular feedback from communities of users around the world on what potentially can go wrong with your uh with your you know the algorithms and and what what has gone wrong the other side of things is uh and and Danny rightly alluded to that is of course the train the the data that you're using who are the engineers working in there we know there's a huge gender and uh racial gap within the the ranks of engineers working at tech platforms so all of this to say that it's not just about, so the regulation focusing only on the result, which is open up the algorithm is, is, it's a great, for me, it's a great step towards transparency. I think it's, it's important that we get there at some point, but obviously it's not sufficient in itself. We need those engineers also be able to work with society and explain what they're doing if they're willing to do so. And I really think that there is a benefit in them doing that, not only for the people working on those algorithms, but also for society as a whole. Thank you. I will just really quickly, because I know we're almost out of time, I will just really quickly say that I agree 100% with this notion that you open up the algorithm, it's not going to tell you anything. I have like long been this kind of person that like thinks that that is just a complete bullshit, like kind of like panacea that we think is going to like to solve something and it's not. Um, the platforms are not neutral because the data that they're training on is not neutral because, as Julie said, the people who are building them are not neutral. All of these tools are just tech and society recapitulating itself in this type of way. And a lot of the, the other piece that I want to say is the one thing that I will add to what Julia just said, which is excellent, is that there is a mistake around the intentionality sometimes, I think, when we talk about bias and that there is this idea or like that these things aren't neutral or like that certain types of training sets. I don't think that people like get up in the morning and like over their Wheaties are kind of like, let's make sure that like, you know, photo sensors for like hand washing, like soap, soap washing dispensers, like don't work for black people. I think it's mostly like there is this invisibility because there is this lack of conversation of people having diverse perspectives in the room and being able to like understand how exactly their platform, their tools that they're building are being used by the entire world. And so like, and what the entire world looks like is they are not reflective of. And so, yes, I think that this movement, I think having more empathy towards that type of thing, not blaming, but trying to build and like have more diverse um, conversations is a huge part of that. Yeah, I, 
I, Peter is signaling to me to wrap up as much as I would love to entertain more questions. And thank you so much for turning up. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Kate. And uh, thank you for being such a lovely audience. <laughs>